13 Reasons Why by Jay Asher, cassette 3, side B. How many of you remember the Oh My Dollar Valentines? How many of us would rather forget? Those were fun, weren't they? You fill out a survey and a computer analyzes your answers, then it cross-references with the other surveys. For just a buck, you can get the name and number of your one true soulmate. For five bucks, you can get your top five. And hey, all the proceeds go to a worthy cause. Cheer camp. Cheer camp. Every morning over the loudspeaker came a cheery announcement. Don't forget there's only four more days to turn in your surveys. Only four more lonely days until your true love is revealed. And every morning, a new peppy cheerleader continued the countdown. Only three more days. Only two more days. Just one more day. Today is the day. For every foot on the sidewalk I put between Tyler's house, Marcus, and me, the muscles in my shoulders relax a little more. Then the whole squad of cheerleaders sang, Oh my dollar, oh my dollar, oh my dollar, Valentine. This, of course, was followed by whoops and hollers and cheers. I always imagined them doing kicks and splits and tossing their pom-poms around in the attendance office. I walked by the attendance office once on an errand for a teacher, and that's exactly what they were doing. And yes, I did fill out my survey. I've been a sucker for surveys my whole life. If you ever caught me reading one of those teen magazines, I swear it wasn't for the makeup tips. It was for the surveys. Because you never wore makeup, Hannah. You didn't need it. Fine, some of the hair and makeup tips were helpful. You wore makeup? But I only picked the magazines up for their surveys. The tips were just a bonus. Do you remember those career surveys we had to fill out freshman year? The ones that were supposed to help us choose electives? According to my survey, I'd make a wonderful lumberjack. And if that career didn't work out, I could use my fallback career as an astronaut. An astronaut or a lumberjack. Seriously, thanks for the help. I don't remember my fallback career, but I got the lumberjack too. I tried figuring out what the test saw that is my best career path. True, I marked it down. I'd like the outdoors, but who doesn't? I mean, I I don't like cutting down trees. (laughs) The Valentine's survey was a two-parter. First, you described yourself, hair color, eye color, height, body type, favorite type of music and movie. Then you put a check beside your top three things to do on the weekends, which is funny because whoever designed the list forgot to mention drinking and sex, which would have been the most accurate response for most of our student body. In all, there were about 20 questions, and I know based on who appeared on my list that not everyone answered honestly. In the middle of the sidewalk, beneath the street lamp, is the dark green metal bench. At one time, maybe this was a bus stop, and now it was just a bench on a, to relax on for old people or anyone too tired to walk. For me. For part two of the survey, it was your turn to describe what you were looking for in a soulmate. Their height, their body type, if they're athletic or not, shy, outgoing. I sit on the cold metal and lean forward, dropping my head into my hands, only a handful of blocks from home, and I don't know where to go. As I filled mine out, I found myself describing a certain someone at our school. Should have answered my survey seriously. You'd think that if my answers all described one person, that person would have at least appeared in my top five. But that person must have been immune to the cheerleaders and their cheers because he didn't end up on my list anywhere. And no, I'm not telling you his name yet. For fun, I filled mine out as Holden Call fell from the catcher in the rye. That semester's required reading and the first person to come to mind. Holden. What a horrible first date that depressed loser would make. The moment the surveys were distributed in third period history, I bubbled in my answers. There sure were some weird names on my list, exactly the sort of people you'd expect for Holden Caulfield. It was your typical day in Coach Patrick's history class. Decipher a bunch of notes scribbled on the board probably five minutes before class started, then copy them down in your notebook. If you finish before the end of class, read eight pages, eight through 194 in your textbook, and don't fall asleep. And no talking. How was I to know every single one of those girls would call me? I assumed everyone at school saw the survey as a joke, just a fundraiser for cheer camp. After class, I walked straight to the student body office. At the end of the counter, closest to the door, was the drop-off box. A large shoebox with a slit cut in the top and decorated with pink cutout hearts and red hearts had Oh My Dollar Valentine written on them. The pink ones had green dollar signs. I folded my survey in half and slipped it into the box, then turned around to leave. 
But Miss Benson, standing smiley as usual, was right there. Hannah Baker, she said. I didn't know you and Courtney Crimson were friends. The look on my face must have expressed exactly what I was thinking, because right away, she backpedaled. At least that's what I figured. That's what it looked like. I mean, you are friends, aren't you? The lady is beyond nosy. My first thought was of Tyler standing outside my window, and I was furious. Was he actually showing off those peeping Tom photos to Miss Benson? No. Miss Benson told me she delivered some checks to the yearbook room that morning. Taped to the walls were some sample shots that might appear in the yearbook. One particular photo was of Courtney and me. You guessed it, the one from the party. With my arm around her waist, looking like I was having the time of my life. Quite an actress, Hannah. I told her, no, we're just acquaintances. Well, it's a really fun picture, Miss Benson said. And this, these next words, I remember exactly. The wonderful thing about a yearbook photo is that everyone shares the moment with you. Forever. It sounded like something she'd said a million times before, and before I probably would have agreed, but not with that photo. Anyone looking at that photo would definitely not be sharing our moment. They could not come close to imagining my thoughts in that picture, or Courtney's, or Tyler's. Everything about it was false. Right then, in that office, with the realization that no one knew the truth about my life, my thoughts about the world were shaken. Like driving along a bumpy road and losing control of the steering wheel, tossing you just a tad off the road. The wheels kick up some dirt, but you're able to pull it back. Yet no matter how tightly you grip the wheel, no matter how hard you try to drive straight, something keeps jerking you to the side. You have so little control over anything anymore. And at some point, the struggle becomes too much, too tiring, and you consider letting go, allowing tragedy or whatever to happen. I press my fingertips hard against my hairline, my thumbs up against my temples. I squeeze. In that picture... I'm sure Courtney was wearing a beautiful smile. Fake, but beautiful. She wasn't, but you couldn't know that. See, Courtney thought she could jerk me around wherever she wanted, but I didn't let that happen. I jerked myself back on the road, just long enough to push her off, if only for a moment. But now, the survey for Valentine's Day? Was this just another chance to get thrown off the road? Was this survey for the guys who found my name on their list going to be excuse they needed to ask me out? And wouldn't they be extra excited about doing that because of the rumors they'd heard? I looked at the slit in the top of the shoebox, too thin to squeeze my fingers through, but I could lift it off the top and take out my survey. It'd be so easy. Miss Benson would ask why, and I could pretend I was embarrassed about filling out a love survey. She'd understand. Or I could wait and see. If I had been smart, if I had been honest with my survey, I would have described Hannah. Maybe we would have talked, seriously talked, not just joking around like last summer at the movie theater. But I didn't do that. I wasn't thinking that way. Would most students, as I expected, get their list and just have a good laugh, nothing, thinking nothing of it? Or would they use it? If Hannah's name and number had shown up on my list, would I have called her? I slouched down into the cold bench, leaning my head back, far back. Like the tip of my spine might burst if I keep going. Very little, I told myself, could go wrong. The survey was a joke. No one's going to use it. Calm down, Hannah. You are not setting yourself up. But if I was right, if I called it correctly, if I willingly gave someone an excuse to test those rumors about me, well, I don't know, maybe I'd shrug it off. Maybe I'd get pissed. Or maybe I would let go and give up. This time, for the first time, I saw the possibilities in giving up. I even found hope in it. Ever since Kat's going away party, I couldn't stop thinking about Hannah, how she looked, how she acted, how it never matched up with what I heard. But I was too afraid to find out for sure. Too afraid she might laugh if I asked her to find out. Just too afraid. So what were my options? I could leave the office, a pessimist, and take my survey with me. Or I could leave it in as an optimist and hope for the best. In the end, I walked out of that office with my survey still in the box, unsure of what I was. An optimist? Pessimist? Neither. A fool. I closed my eyes, concentrating on the cool air floating around me. When I went to the movie theater last summer for a job application, 
I pretended to be surprised that Hannah worked there, but she was the whole reason I applied. Today's the day, the cheerleader said cheerfully, of course. Pick up your own my dollar valentines in the student body office today. On my first day at work, they placed me in concession stand with Hannah. She showed me how to pump the butter topping onto the popcorn. She said that if someone I had a crush on came in, I shouldn't put butter in the bottom half of the tub. That way, halfway through the movie, they'd come out without asking for more, and then there wouldn't be so many people around and we could talk. But I never did that, because it was Hannah I was interested in. And the thought that she did that for other guys made me jealous. I hadn't decided yet if I wanted to find out who the survey matched me up with. But with my luck, it'd be a fellow lumberjack. But, but when I walked in by the office and found no one standing in line, I thought, what the hell? I went up to the counter and started saying my name. But the cheerleader at the computer cut me off. Thanks for supporting the cheerleaders, Hannah. She tilted her head to one side and smiled. That sounded dumb, right? But I'm supposed to say it to everyone. It was probably the same cheerleader who gave me my survey results. She typed my name into the computer, hit enter, and asked how many names I wanted. One or five. I placed a $5 bill on the counter. She hit the number five key, and a printer on my side of the computer spit out my list. She told me they put a printer on our side so the cheerleaders wouldn't be tempted to peek at our names, so people wouldn't feel embarrassed by who they got. I told her that was a good idea and started looking over my list. So, the cheerleader said, who'd you get? Definitely the cheerleader who helped me. She was joking, of course. No, she wasn't. Half joking, I placed my list on the counter for her to see. Not bad, she said. Ooh, I like this one. I agreed that it wasn't a bad list, but not wonderful either. She lifted her shoulders and called my list a shrugger, and then she let me in on a little secret. It wasn't the most scientific of surveys except for the people seeking a depressed loner like Holden Caulfield. For that, the survey deserved a Nobel Prize. We both agreed that the two names on my list that matched me fairly well, another one I was pleased with, brought an entirely different reaction out of her. No, she said. Her expression, her posture, lost all its cheeriness. Trust me, no. Is he on one of your tapes, Hannah? Is that who this tape is about? Because I don't think this tape is about the cheerleader. But he's cute, I said. On the outside... She told me. She pulled out a, stock, a stack of fives from the register, put mine on top, and went through the stack, turning each bill the same way. I didn't push the subject, but I should have. And in a couple more tapes, you'll know why. Which reminds me, I haven't told you who our main man on this tape is. Fortunately, this is the perfect time to introduce him, because that's exactly when he showed up. Again, not me. Something started buzzing. A phone? I looked at the cheerleader. But she shook her head. So I swung my backpack onto the counter, fished out my phone, and answered it. Anna Baker, the caller said. Good to see you. I looked at the cheerleader and shrugged. Who is this? I asked. Guess how I got your number, he said. I told him that I hated guessing games, so he told me. I paid for it. You paid for my phone number. The cheerleader scooped her hand over her mouth and pointed at the printout. The owe my dollar valentines. No way, I thought. Someone was actually calling because my name was on their list. Kind of exciting, yes, but kind of weird at the same time. The cheerleader touched the names we both thought were good matches, but I shook my head no. I knew those voices well enough to know it wasn't either of them. It also wasn't the one she warned me about. I read the other two names on my list out loud. Looks like you made my list, the caller said, but I didn't make yours. Actually, you did make her list. A different list. One I'm sure you don't like being on. I asked him where his name, where on his list my name popped up. Again, he told me to guess. Then quickly added that he was joking. Ready for this? He asked. You're my number one, Hannah. I mouthed his answer. Number one. And the cheerleader hopped up and down. This is so cool, she whispered. The caller then asked what I was doing for Valentine's Day. Depends. I told him, who are you? But he didn't answer. He didn't need to, because at that moment, I saw him standing right outside the office window, Marcus Cooley. Hello, Marcus. I gripped my teeth. Marcus. I should have hit him with the rock when I had the chance. Marcus, as you know, is one of the biggest goof-offs at school. Not a slacker goof-off, but a good goof-off. Guess again. He's actually funny. 
An endless number of painfully dull classes would have been rescued by a perfectly timed coolie pun, so naturally I didn't take his words at face value. Even though he only stood a few feet away, separated by a window, I kept talking to him through the phone. You're lying, I said. I'm not on your list. His normally goofy smirk at that moment looked kind of sexy. What, you don't think I'm ever serious? He asked. Then he pressed his list against the window. Even though I stood too far away to actually read it, I assumed he'd only hold it up to prove that my name did, in fact, hold his top spot. Still, I thought he must have been kidding about getting together for Valentine's Day, so I thought I'd make him squirm a bit. Fine, I said. When? Cheerleader covered her face with both hands, but through her fingers I watched her skin blush. I don't know. Without her as an audience egging me on, I doubt I would have agreed to go out with him that fast, but I was playing it up, giving her something to brag about at cheer practice. Now? It was Marcus's turn to blush. Oh, um, okay, well, how about Rosie's, you know, for ice cream? E5. I saw that star on the map while riding the bus. I knew roughly where it was, just not which store specifically. But I should have guessed. The best ice cream and the greasiest burgers and fries around. Rosie's diner. My words came out sarcastic. Ice cream? But I didn't mean them that way. An ice cream date just sounded so cute. So I agreed to meet him there after school. And with that, we hung up. The cheerleader slapped her hands on the counter. You have absolutely got to let me brag about this. I made her promise not to tell anyone until the next day, just in case. Fine, she said. But she made me promise to spill every last detail afterward. Some of you may know the cheerleader I've been talking about, but I'm not saying her name. She was very sweet and excited for me. She did nothing wrong. Honestly, no sarcasm there. Don't strain yourselves reading into my words. Before I thought I knew who the cheerleader was, but now remembering the day we all found out about Hannah, I'm sure of it. Jenny Kurtz. We had biology together. By then I had already heard, but that's when she found out. Scalpel in hand, an earthworm sliced down the middle, pinned open for her. She put down the scalpel and fell into a long, stunned silence. Then she got up, without stopping by the teacher's desk for a pass, and walked out of the room. I kept looking for her the rest of the day, puzzled by her reaction. Like most people, I had no clue of her random connection to Hannah Baker. Did I tell the cheerleader about what happened at Rosie's? No. Instead, I avoided her for as long as I could. And you're about to find out why. Of course, I couldn't avoid her forever. Which is why, in a little while, she'll make another appearance on these tapes. But with a name. The cold air isn't the only reason I'm shivering anymore. With every side of every tape, an old memory gets turned upside down, a reputation twists into someone I don't recognize. I felt like crying when I watched Jenny walk out of biology. Every time I saw a reaction like that, with her, with Mr. Porter, it threw me back to the moment I found out about Hannah myself, when I did cry. When instead, I should have been angry at them. So if you want the full Hannah experience, go to Rosie's for yourself. God, I hate not knowing what to believe anymore. I hate not knowing what's real. E5 on your map? Sit down on one of those stools at the counter. In a minute, I'll tell you what to do after seating yourself. But first, a little background on me and Rosie's. I had never gone there before that day. I know it seems crazy. Everyone's been to Rosie's. It's the cool, quirky place to hang out. But as far as I knew, no one ever went there alone. And every time someone invited me, for some reason or another, I was busy. Family visiting from out of town, too much homework, always something. To me, Rosie's had an aura about it, a mystery. In the stories I'd heard, it seemed like things were always happening there. Alex Standall, his first week in town, had his first fight outside Rosie's front door. He told me and Jessica about it during our Monet's Garden Cafe period. When I heard about that fight, it came as advice not to mess with the new kid. Alex knew how to throw, as well as take a punch. A girl whose name I will not repeat had her first under-the-bra experience at Rosie's while making out between the pinball machines. Courtney Crimson. Everybody knew about that, and it's not like Courtney tried to hide it. With all the stories, it seemed that Rosie turned a blind eye to anything going on as long as cones were being filled and burgers were being flipped. So I wanted to go, but I was not about to go alone and look like a dork. Marcus Cooley gave me the excuse I needed, and it just so happened that I was free. Free but not stupid. I was a little wary of Marcus, a little suspicious, but 
Not of him so much as the people he hung out with. People like Alex Standle. After peeling away from our all y'all oxen free group at Monet's, Alex started hanging out with Marcus, and after the little stunt Alex pulled with the who's and hot who's not list, I didn't trust him. So why would I trust someone he hangs out with? You shouldn't. Why? Because it's exactly what I wanted for me. I wanted people to trust me, despite anything they'd heard. And more than that, I wanted them to know me. Not the stuff they thought they knew about me, know the real me. I wanted them to get past the rumors, to see beyond the relationships I once had or maybe still had, but that they didn't agree with. And if I wanted people to treat me that way, then I had to do the same for them, right? So I walked into Rosie's and sat at the corner. And when you go there, if you go there, don't order right away. The phone in my pocket starts vibrating. Just sit and wait. And wait a little more. It's mom. I answer the phone, but... Even the simplest words catch in my throat and I say nothing. Honey, her voice is soft. Is everything all right? I close my eyes to concentrate, to speak calmly. I'm I'm fine. She doesn't hear it. Clay, honey, it's getting late. She pauses. Where are you? I forgot to call. I'm sorry. It's okay. She hears it, but she won't ask. Do you want me to pick you up? Can't go home. Not yet. I almost tell her I need to stay till I'm done helping Tony with his school project, but I'm almost done with this tape, and I only have one more with me. Mom, can you do me a favor? No response. I left some tapes on the workbench. For your project? Wait, but what if she listens to them? What if, to see what they are, she slides the tape into the stereo. What if it's Hannah talking about me? It's okay. Never mind. I'll, I'll get them. I can bring them to you. I don't answer. The words aren't caught in my throat. I just don't know which ones to you. I'm heading out that way, she says. We're out of bread and I'm making sandwiches for tomorrow. I exhale a tiny laugh and smile. Whenever I'm out late, she makes a sandwich for my school lunch. I always protest and tell her not to, saying I'll make my own when I get home, but she likes it. Says it reminds her of when I was younger and needed her. Just tell me where you are, she says. Leaning forward on the metal bench, I say the first thing that comes to mind. I'm at Rosie's. The diner, are you getting work done there? She waits for an answer, but I don't have one. Doesn't it get loud? The street is empty. No cars, no noise, no commotion in the background. She knows I'm not telling the truth. When are you going to leave? I ask. As soon as I get the tapes. Great. Start walking. I'll see you soon. Listen to the conversations around you. Are people wondering why you're sitting there alone? Now glance over your shoulder. Did a conversation stop? Did their eyes turn away? I'm sorry if this sounds pathetic, but you know it's true. You've never gone there by yourself, have you? I haven't. It's a totally different experience. And deep down, you know the reason you've never gone there alone is the reason I just explained. But if you do go, and you don't order anything, everyone's going to think the same thing about you that they thought about me. That you're waiting for someone. So sit there. And every few minutes, glance at the clock on the wall. The longer you wait, and this is true, the slower the hands will move. Not today. When I get there, my heart will be racing as I watch the hands spin closer and closer to Mom walking through the door. I start to run. When 15 minutes are up, you have my permission to order a shake. Because 15 minutes is 10 minutes longer than it should take even the slowest person to walk there from school. Somebody isn't coming. Now, if you need a recommendation, you can't go wrong with the banana and peanut butter shake. Then keep waiting, however long it takes to finish your shake. If 30 minutes go by, start digging in with your spoon so you can get the hell out of there. That's what I did. You're an ass, Marcus. You stood her up when you never even had to ask her out to begin with. It was a fundraiser for cheer camp. If you didn't want to take it seriously, you didn't have to. 30 minutes is a long time to wait for a Valentine's Day date, especially inside Rosie's Diner by yourself. It also gives you plenty of time to wonder what happened. Did he forget? Because he seemed sincere. I mean, even the cheerleader thought he meant it, right? I keep running. Calm down, Hannah. That's what I keep telling myself. You're not setting yourself up for a fall. Calm down. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? Isn't that how I convince myself not to pull my survey out of the box? Okay, stop. Those were my thoughts running through my head after waiting 30 minutes for Marcus to show up, which probably didn't put me in a good frame of mind for when he finally did show up. My running slows. 
Not because I'm out of breath or my legs are ready to collapse. I'm not physically tired, but I'm exhausted. If Marcus didn't stand her up, then what? He sat down on the stool next to me and apologized. I told him that I'd almost given up and left. He looked at my empty milkshake glass and apologized again. But it is in his mind. He wasn't late. He wasn't sure I'd even be there. And I'm not going to hold that against him. Apparently he thought we were joking about the date. Or he seemed, assumed we were joking about the date. But halfway home, he stopped and thought about it and headed to Rosie's just in case. And that's why you're on this tape, Marcus. You turned around just in case. Just in case I, Hannah Baker, Miss Reputation, was waiting for you. And sadly, I was. At the time, I just thought it might be fun. At the time, I was stupid. There's Rosie's, across the street, at the far end of the parking lot. See, when Marcus came into Rosie's, he wasn't alone. No, Marcus came into Rosie's with a plan. Part of that plan was to move us away from the counter to a booth near the back near the pinball machines, with me on the inside. Me sandwiched between him and a wall. The parking lot is nearly empty. Only a few cars directly in front of Rosie's, but none of them are moms, so I stop. If you want, if you're sitting at Rosie's right now, stay at the counter. It's more comfortable there, believe me. So I stand on the curb, breathing deep, exhaling hard. A red hand flashes at the intersection across the street. I don't know how much of his plan was thought out, maybe he arrived with just an endgame, a goal, and like I said, Marcus is funny, so there we were, sitting in a booth with our backs to the rest of the diner, laughing. At one point, Marcus had me laughing so hard that my stomach hurt. I leaned over, touching my forehead to his shoulder, begging him to stop. The hand keeps flashing, urging me to make up my mind, telling me to hurry. I still have time to run across the street, jump the curb, and race through the parking lot to Rosie's, but I don't. And that's when his hand touched my knee. That's when I knew. The hand stopped flashing. A solid bright red hand and I turn around. I can't go in there, not yet. I stopped laughing. I nearly stopped breathing. But I kept my forehead against your shoulder, Marcus. There was your hand on my knee from out of nowhere. The same way I was grabbed in the liquor store. What are you doing? I whispered. Do you want me to move it? You asked. I didn't answer. I pressed my hand against my stomach. It's too much, too much to handle. I'll go to Rosie's in a minute, and hopefully I'll get there before Mom. But first, the theater where Hannah and I worked for one summer, a place where she was safe, the Crestmont. And I didn't move away from you either. It was like you and your shoulder weren't connected anymore. Your shoulder was just a prop to rest my head against while I figured things out. And I couldn't look away as your fingertips caressed my knee and started moving up. Why are you doing that? I asked. It's only a block away, and maybe it's not a red star on our map, but it should have been. It's a red star to me. Your shoulder rotated, and I lifted my head. But now your arm was behind my back, pulling me close. And your other hand was touching my leg, my upper thigh. I looked over the back of the booth to the other booths, the counter, trying to catch someone's eye. And a few people glanced over, but they all turned away. Below the table, my fingers were fighting to pry your fingers off, to loosen your grip, to push you away. And I didn't want to yell, but it wasn't that level yet, but my eyes, they were begging for help. I shoved my hands into my pockets, balled into fists. I want to slam them into a wall or punch them through a store window. I've never hit anything or anyone before, and already just tonight I've wanted to hit Marcus with that rock. But everyone turned away. No one asked if there was a problem. Why? Were they being polite? Was that it, Zach? Were you just being polite? Zach, again? With Justin on the first tape, falling on Hannah's lawn, then interrupting me and Hannah at Cat's going away party. I hate this. I don't want to find out how everyone fits together anymore. Stop it, I said. I know you heard me because with me looking over the backrest, your mouth was just inches away from your ear. Stop it. The Crestmont, I round the corner and... Less than half a block away, there it is. One of the few landmarks left in town. The last Art Deco theater in the state. Don't worry, you said. And maybe you knew your time was short because your hand immediately slid up from my thigh. All the way up. So I rammed both of my hands into your side, throwing you to the floor. Now when someone falls out of a booth, it's kind of funny. It just is. 
So you'd think people would have started laughing, unless, of course, they knew it wasn't an accident. So they knew something was going on in that booth, and they just didn't feel like helping. Thanks. The wraparound marquee stretching over the sidewalk, the ornate sign reaching o- to the sky like an electric peacock feather. Each letter flickers on one at a time. C, R, E, S, T, M, O, N, T. Like filling in a crossword puzzle with neon letters. Anyway, you left. You didn't storm out, just call me a tease loud enough for everyone to hear and walked out. So now, let's back up. To me sitting at that corner, counter, getting ready to leave. To me, thinking Marcus wasn't showing up because he simply didn't care. And I'll tell you what I was thinking then, because now it applies even more. I walked toward the Crestmont. The other stores I pass are all closed for the night. Solid wall of darkened windows, but then a triangular wedge cuts away from the sidewalk. Its walls and marble floor the same color as the neon sign. Pointing into the lobby in the middle of the wedge, the box office like a toll booth with windows on three sides and a door in the rear. That's where I work most nights. For the longest time, from almost day one at this school, it seemed like I was the only one who cared about me. Put all of your heart into getting that first kiss only to have it thrown back in your face. Have the only two people you truly trust turn against you. Have one of them use you to get back at the other, then be accused of betrayal? Are you getting it now? Am I going too fast? Well, keep up. Let someone take away any sense of privacy or security you might still possess. Then have someone use that insecurity to satisfy their own twisted curiosity. She pauses, slows down a bit. Then come to realize that you're making mountains out of molehills. Realize how petty you've become. Sure, it may feel like you can't get a grip on this town. It may seem that every time someone offers you a hand, they just let go, and you just slip further down. But you must stop being so pessimistic, Hannah, and learn to trust those around you. So I do. One more time. The last movie of the night is playing, so the box office is empty. I stand on the swirling marbled floor, surrounded by posters of coming attractions. This was my chance at this theater to reach Hannah. It was my chance, and I let it slip away. And then, well, certain thoughts begin creeping around. Will I ever get control of my life? Will I always be shoved back and pushed around by those I trust? I hate what, I, what you did, Hannah. Will my life ever go where I want it to? You didn't have to do it, and I hate the fact that you did. The next day, Marcus and I decided something. I decided to find out how people at school might react if one of the students never came back. As the song goes, you are lost and gone forever. Oh, my darling Valentine. I leaned back against the poster locked behind a plastic frame, and I closed my eyes. I'm listening to someone give up, someone I knew, someone I liked. I'm listening, but still, I'm I'm too late. My heart is pounding, and I can't sit still. I walk across the marble floor to the boxed office. A small sign hangs by a chain and a tiny suction cup. Closed. See you tomorrow. From out here, it doesn't look so cramped, but in there, it felt like a fishbowl. My only interaction came when people slid money over to my side of the glass, and I slid back their tickets, or when a coworker let themselves in through the rear door. Other than that, if I wasn't selling tickets, I was reading or staring out of the fishbowl to the lobby watching Hannah, and some nights were worse than others. Some nights I watched to make sure she buttered the popcorn all the way through which seems silly now and obsessive, but that's what I did. Like the night Bryce Walker came, he arrived with his girlfriend of the moment and wanted me to charge her the under-12 rate. She won't be watching the movie anyway, he said. You know what I mean, Clay? Then he laughed. I didn't know her. She might have been a student from another school. One thing was clear. She didn't seem to think it was funny. She placed her purse on the counter. I'll pay for my own ticket then? Bryce moved her purse aside and paid the full amount. Just relax, he told her. It was a joke. About halfway through the movie, when I, while I sold tickets for the next show, the girl came tearing out of the theater, 
holding her wrist, maybe crying. And Bryce was nowhere to be seen. Kept watching the lobby, waiting for him to show, but he never did. He stayed behind to finish watching the movie he paid for. But when the movie was over, he leaned against the concession counter, talking Hannah's ear off as everyone else left. And he stayed there while new people came in. Hannah filled drink orders, handed out candy, gave back change, and laughed at Bryce. Laughed at whatever he said. The entire time, I wanted to flip the clothes sign over. I wanted to march into the lobby and ask him to leave. The movie was over and he didn't need to be here anymore. But that was Hannah's job. She should have asked him to leave. No, she should have wanted him to leave. Through selling my last ticket and turning over the sign, I exited through the box office door and locked it up behind me and went to the lobby to help Hannah clean up, to ask about Bryce. Why do you think that girl ran out of here like that, I asked. Hannah stopped wiping the counter and looked at me, straight in the eye. I know who he is, Clay. I know what he's like, believe me. I know, I said. I looked down and touched a carpet stain with the toe of my shoe. I was just wondering then, why'd you keep talking to him? She didn't answer, not right away. But I, could raise my, I couldn't raise my eyes to face her. I didn't want to see a look of disappointment or frustration in her eyes. I didn't want to see those kinds of emotions directed at me. Eventually, she said the words that ran through my mind the rest of that night. You don't need to watch out for me, Clay. But I did, Hannah, and I wanted to. I could have helped you, but when I tried, you pushed me away. I can almost hear Hannah's voice speaking my next thought for me. And why didn't you try harder?